Let me ask, first of all, what the um, uh, difficulties are and how you've met those difficulties in order to deal with these vaccines. Yeah, so if you transport vaccines, you have a challenge with temperature control. It's very sensitive material. In, in case of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine, it needs, you know, dry ice, which is not allowed at, at high amounts on airplanes. But we are used to that. You know, we have a global footprint of life science experts. 9,000 people are working in that industry and in our, in, in our payroll. And we know exactly what to do. And we, we of course, have prepared for that situation now for months. And, and that's the reason why... Stuff is really moving swiftly at the moment. It, the question is more how much vaccines is produced, but you know we are well prepared and it works very well. Yes, and I saw that you did a deal with Australia, and I wonder what other deals you're working on. Good morning to you, Frank. What other deals you're working on on this uh, on the supply of this uh, the global effort to supply the vaccine? Yeah, so we have done a lot of stuff already, uh, but we. We hardly talk about that because, of course, you know, we don't want to be at the forefront. You know, that's the job of the politicians or the producers of pharmaceuticals. But we have done already, we flew already just in Europe 50 airplanes uh, to really serve the markets. And, and we will continue to do so or store it in high, uh, in low temperature refrigerators. So, you know, all this is moving. Uh, but this is relatively normal for an organization like ours with expertise in that field. Uh, how large a share of global air freight capacity have you been able to take, Frank? Because with passenger aircraft, a lot of them, you know, grounded, I, I feel like DHL and Deutsche Post can really jump on this situation and, and conquer some of the market. You're absolutely right. You know, we have a competitive advantage by running a, a global integrator express business with more than 250 uh, you know, airplanes which are controlled by us. In addition, uh, being the largest air freight forwarder, of course, we have worked with cargo airlines in addition to that. And that has really helped us last year to secure a lot of capacity to help our customers uh, very nicely. And you can receive that as well in our record numbers, which we just released, um, you know, two weeks ago, uh, because we had a best year ever. And that, of course, is driven by our capabilities uh, and by the demand, which is still going on, and not enough capacity, neither in the air nor on the ocean. Uh, and, Frank, how do you expect rates for air freight to develop then from here, given what we've seen already? What, what's the trajectory? Yeah, so, you know, the, the driver for that for a change would be belly space capacity. And belly space capacity is completely linked to that people start traveling intercontinental again. That needs to be allowed by governments first. Uh, and second, you know, passengers should feel health and safe. And if they don't do that, then we will see definitely in 2021 a, a very slow recovery, if even at all, a recovery of intercontinental travel. And even 2022, I think we will see a delay of that, and maybe in 2023 we have normal levels. So that means in this year we should expect high rates in the market. Customers should expect high rates in for air freight, and probably even in 2022. Uh, but that very much depends on how fast the world gets vaccinated and authorities allow that people who are vaccinated can travel again. You know, um, our reporter Laura Wright was telling us the other day that 5% of trucks have been stopped on the EU-UK border. And we've heard a, a lot about bottlenecks there. What can you tell us about the flow of goods between the EU and, and the UK? So, yeah, indeed, it's a little bit more challenging, but it's not a complete mess, uh, as people predicted. You know, fortunately, we got an agreement. You know, our stuff is moving. We are picking up. What actually is surprising sometimes that customers have not ex expected what they have to provide and we are educating our customers you know what is necessary you know many of these customers are exporting outside EVU as well and used to demonstrate certain documents i think the situation will normalize pretty rapidly after customers understand what is necessary then they will provide and we see a very fast renormalization i think you know it is not as bad people always uh, expect worse situation than they are still it's challenging but stuff is moving, and I think, you know, in a couple of months we have forgotten that even. We have not forgotten then the impact of the uh, economic environment in the UK and in the EU. You know, we spend now more money on border control. Who has any benefit from that? There is not a single UK citizen, nor in the EU, has any benefit if we have higher cost for clearance. 
And that's a problem. And we said that from the beginning. It's a stupid idea to exit the EU because it adds additional costs without any benefits for anybody. But that's the case now. We got, fortunately, in the last minute, a somehow deal, and that helps. But the idea as such is not good. I suppose the, the, the UK government would suggest perhaps they want to hammer out trade deals with other parts of the world. Frank, uh, given your experience in, in logistics and in global trade, how much of a difference would that make? Of course, it's a good idea to make trade uh, deals, but, you know, what's the idea to make trade deals if you exit the biggest trade union first? You know, I, I don't understand the concept. Of course, now the UK needs free trade deals, but they could easily get them as well together with the EU. But anyway, you know, we can't change history. We only can look forward, and I think we should make the best out of that. And that might be good if even the EU and the UK, you know, over time develop other elements of a, of a more seamless process. Again, extra costs don't add any value to anybody, neither in the UK and the EU. And you can see that. If you go back, productivity has improved in both parts in the trade union. It has created wealth. So why is then the argument that it's better the other way around? The UK needs, of course, a trade deals, and hopefully they get some, because it will help the UK and other markets, because the more free trade deals we have, the better is it for everybody on this planet.